Hello, this is Ken Yeager, president of the Yosemite Climbing Association. I'd like to welcome you to the 18th annual Yosemite Facelift. Uh, before we get started on tonight's programming, I'd like to introduce our new executive director, and her name is Laura Waddles. Thanks for that introduction, Ken. I'm really excited to be part of this event um, and part of the YCA in general. And uh, I'm going to kick off tonight by thanking our sponsors. So our co-presenting sponsor, the North Face, and of course, the official vehicle of facelift, Subaru. Now, some of you may have noticed that Timmy O'Neill is not here this year, and he's not going to show up. He is currently climbing on the Incredible Hulk and filming with Patagonia. Uh, another person you may have noticed is not here is Allison Gonzalez. She uh, works on the facelift in Yosemite Climbing Association year-round, um, and uh, there's an obvious reason why she's not here, and uh, she has something to say. Hi, facelift family. This is Allison, and I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person this year with Ken, Laura, and the team. But I wanted to say a special thank you to Laura this year for stepping up and taking on a lot of activity behind the scene to make Facelift Act Local and Yosemite Facelift possible. Also to Linda Jarrett and Kaya Lindsay, who is our marketing director. Without them, this all would not be happening. I'm here at my home in La Honda, California, looking forward to cleaning up the beaches on the Central California coast. And I'm so excited that you're here with us. What you do matters and people notice. So enjoy Facelift this year and I'll see you next year. Uh, next we have um, a blessing from Julia Parker to really kick off Facelift officially. I'm going to be singing a, a blessing for the Facelift in uh, Yosemite Ballet for Ken Yeager. Uh, thank you so much, Julia Parker, and I'd also like to thank the Parker family. Uh, Julia is uh, world-renowned for her basket weaving. She has two honorary degrees, one from Fresno State and one from Berkeley. Uh, she's an, considered an expert basket weaver, and she once gave a basket to the queen. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our presenters. Um, uh, that are here tonight and all of our staff that are helping our film crew we got Ed and Jim and Karen and uh, lots of people here helping make this happen I'd also like to uh, really thank our presenters this year it was difficult to put this whole event together this year we had to change things several times and our presenters had to come up with programs on short notice so I really like to thank them for that and uh, I just want to mention that um, while you're watching this video, you should go ahead and click the subscribe button so you can see more videos like this from us. Um, and then I have some logistics to go over. Um, so first of all, thank you to all of the volunteers that have signed up. We actually have reached over a thousand volunteers that pre-registered for this event, which is amazing. Um, so thank you, you make it possible. Um, and for those of you have, who have not registered yet, although the Yosemite portion is closed, you can still sign up for the Act Local portion. Um, and the way that you will do that is you'll go to YosemiteFacelift.com. Um, that will repeat some of the instructions I'm going over, uh, but what you'll do is you will uh, sign up there, pre-register, and then you will post a photo on Instagram, and you will make sure to hashtag FacelifTActLocal. 
Um, and when you do that, you are entered for our giveaways from our generous sponsors, Patagonia. Uh, they have two jackets a day that they will be giving away. <laughs> Um, they are mic micro puff jackets, and um, they wanted us to also mention that the colors may vary, but yes, so two jackets, a men's and a women's, will go out uh, each day for that giveaway. Um, and yeah, and uh, I'd like to talk about our new home in Mariposa, uh, the town of Mariposa in the, town, in the county of Mariposa. And uh, we have a short film that's going to kind of show some of the things that Mariposa County has to offer. This film was uh, submitted by Bill Lowe, and I'd like to thank Bill for getting it to us. You ready to go? Let's go, fast! Ready? Let's go skydiving, woo!
thank you so much to Bill Lowe for that video showing our viewers what Mariposa County is all about. Um, I've lived here for seven years and I don't plan on uh, leaving anytime soon. I really love it here and the community is amazing. Um, next up is a video called Art of Our Culture, which will be highlighting uh, the Yosemite Climbing Museum that we're filming in currently. I began climbing at about 14 or 15 years old in the San Fernando Valley at Stony Point, and I'd never really been anywhere beyond that for about a year, and then I went out to Joshua Tree and it kind of blew my mind. In Yosemite, I really had no clue what it looked like. This was probably 1972. I don't even remember any photos. I think I had seen something about Warren Harding in 1970 climbing the Don Wall. Like instead of graduating high school, I, I, I ended up with some friends that were going to the valley and came through 41 from Fresno, came through the tunnel and there was Yosemite. My work was really directly inspired by Tom Frost and Glenn Denny's work. So Glenn Denny photos and Tom Frost photos were interspersed throughout uh, all the media at that time because they were the two main photographers. And I didn't even know who they were, but you see these images and you go, oh my God. They were doing first ascents on El Cap and other places around Yosemite. The difference was they brought a camera with them and they knew how to use it. It enabled people to dream about doing El Cap and Half Dome and some of these other climbs. The concept that I can read really early on is that you're a participant in this journey along with your friends with the fact that I, I understood it. They were kind of speaking the same language I was, or I obviously was speaking the same language they were. And, and looking at the climbing photographs and looking at their portraits of, of climbers, I could see that these were their partners and I knew it was their partners simply because I knew who Tom Frost was. I knew what he meant to, to Royal Robbins. And so as my own path in, in climbing photography um, went on, I could see how that relationship with those people in those photographs became more paramount than the actual photographs themselves. And at that point, I think my work began to transcend. When I started making Stone Master photographs, I kind of realized that maybe that this was my calling. My connection with Yosemite climbing and my connection with Yosemite photography or climbing photography is kind of deep. I think that a lot of the photographers that come here and work also feel that connection. I know a lot of these guys and so I've, I've talked to them and they also feel that connection and they also look at what came before them. Part of the thing we're trying to express here at this gallery is to 
look at what's been collected and try to think about it as a continuation. And to that end, the, the kind of photography that I like the most is the photograph that was made between friends. Those are the hardest ones to find sometimes. It, it, sometimes it's easy to find professionals and that's kind of a, a, a beautiful photograph. But the problem I have with a professional photograph versus a photograph made between friends is a uh, professional, you always know there's a camera between you and that subject or the subject knows there's a camera between you and the photographer. Whereas with a friend, the camera's just up for a moment and then it's gone. It's almost as if it was just a, a pause in the conversation. My work with Dean Potter was kind of a really personal journey for me. It was really based on a friendship more than anything. Dean could have worked with anyone. He enjoyed working with me more because of our friendship. We really got along well and we were able to do things at its own pace. And I was independent enough that I allowed him to have his independence. So I never really put too much input to what we were doing. I let him have his vision and then I simply refined the vision. And, and it, you know, it was that way all along where it was this kind of an adventure. We would hang out and there would be other monkeys hanging out with us. and. Dean had sort of a vision to do something and everybody sort of had their role in, in making that vision happen, but it was more, we were all kind of doing it because it was the adventure of what was actually going on, what he was going to do. But yeah, I loved that guy and I think he loved me and we were like, it was, it was an exciting ride and it kind of, kind of arced the same time that the monkeys were happening and I miss him every day. And the photographs that I made even though they're as soulful as I could make them, I don't think they really express fully how, how much he actually meant to me and a lot of people. So yeah, that's one of, the, one of the blessings and curses, I guess, of making these kind of photographs is you get so involved with the people you're making the photographs and then if they pass, then like Sean Leary, like Roberta Nunez, like uh, you know John Backer, like a lot of people in my photographs, they're gone. You make a photograph that you think that really touches how you feel about them, then you have that to always look at. You know, feelings aren't facts. They're simply part of a memory, and that's something that's changed. When you look in that photograph, for maybe for a moment, you can get the feeling that is a fact in that moment. So that's why I really do try to um, make my photographs as if I'm having a conversation with that subject, with that climb, or with that landscape, whatever, we're fully engaged with each other because I always want to remember that moment and I always want to try to express something about the, my subject matter. So, um, so there you have it. Dean's big on you know, climbing photography as an art and not just as a documentation. Not only has great photos on his own, but he also has an eye for picking the photographs that um, some of the 60s photographers did and other photographers, and he can clean those photos up and really make them look good. And When you see things presented in the way that we are going to present them and are currently presenting them, you understand how this is the art of our culture.
Thank you so much, uh, Max Buscini, for that wonderful film. Uh, for those of you uh, that want to see the Climbing Museum, you can visit us in Mariposa right along Highway 140. The address is 5180 Highway 140, and it's right by the four-way stop. Uh, next, uh, we're going to have a little pan around. You get a little tease right now. Jim, can you move the camera around so people can see what's going on inside the building? We are recording from our museum in Mariposa. And next up, after we finish this pan around, we're going to have a nice video from War Girl. They're our favorite dance band from 2019. Thanks, War Girl, for that video. Uh, I'm a really big fan of theirs. They've played locally before, and of course, they've played uh, for the facelift too. It's hard not to dance when they uh, when they are playing music. Um, so next is going to be um, a special video from Whitney Stowe, who actually grew up with the facelift. Um, but first, we're going to have a quick word from our sponsors.
What kind of value are you looking for with your next new vehicle? With Subaru, you get Kelly Blue Book's 2020 Best Resale Value brand, 2020 Lowest 5-Year Cost to Own brand, and Most Trusted brand for six consecutive years. No wonder Kelly Blue Book also picked Subaru as their 2020 Best Overall brand. A trusted brand and a proven value. It's easy to love a Subaru. Hey everyone, my name is Whitney Stowe and I want to welcome you to the 2021 facelift. I was fortunate to spend most of my childhood growing up in Yosemite, running around the valley. My family was based out of Groveland, a little town just outside the west entrance of Yosemite. But both my parents lived and worked in the park prior to having kids, so growing up we spent all of our time there. You know, we definitely considered Yosemite home. My dad was a rock climbing guide for the Yosemite Mountaineering School. So naturally when us kids came along, they just got us involved in the uh, family activity. <laughs> Even after my sister and I were born, my parents found a way to balance climbing and their Yosemite life with domestic life. So I think their way of doing that was just dragging us along. <laughs> I think because of my childhood in Yosemite, the facelift has always meant a lot to me. It's kind of always been like a big fun family gathering of friends in the climbing community and a great way to just give back to the park. So we attended the facelift every year. I guess it was at the very first one, where we just filled up Ken Yeager's truck with trash from around Camp 4, but I think I was definitely a little too small to remember. We always helped out in the booth, signing up volunteers, or mopping beer off the auditorium floor. But most of the time we were out there picking up trash and getting into shenanigans with the other park kids. Over the years, I've been diving into climbing more and more, and that's really helped me realize just how special those childhood experiences were and feel really, really grateful for Yosemite and the climbing community. As I climb and travel more and more, I've really begun to realize the reach the facelift can have. I hope most people have some kind of outdoor space they connect with and think of as home. So cheers to the 2021 facelift. I'm psyched to join everyone in celebrating our favorite outdoor spaces and giving back to these places we all love so much. Well, thank you, Whitney. We're uh, fortunate enough to have Whitney here and uh, I'm gonna ask her a couple questions. <laughs> First of all, welcome, Whitney. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> and uh, it's, such, it's such a trip for me because I remember when she was a little kid picking up trash and now she's a full-on grown-up and, <laughs> and she's doing a live interview with us. So oh how my. about that? Yeah, how about that? Oh. I got a question for you. Do you know how your parents met? Do you want to tell us that story? Um, supposedly they met at the Mountain Room Bar, I guess. As the story goes, my mother might have to correct me on this if I'm wrong. Uh, Warren Harding put my dad's hand on her knee and just said it had to happen. So, and then I guess the rest is history. And then Ken Yeager's birthday party was really where things kicked off, I guess. <laughs> no. So maybe we should credit Ken. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Uh, I don't think so. Um, what's it like to, to grow up doing the facelift every year from starting out as a child, yeah, and then through the years, you kind of had more and more responsibility. Do you want to walk through some of the different things you've done for the facelift over the years as you grew up? For sure, yeah, it's been great. Like, you know, always a time to revisit the Yosemite climbing community, catch up with old friends. But I mean, as a little kid, a little sprout, I don't think I was up to much just causing shenanigans. And then slowly becoming more and more involved, like signing up volunteers in the booth, uh, yeah, mopping beer off the auditorium floor at night after every evening event. Now you get to drink it. And right? now I get to drink it. It's getting better and better as we go. Um, uh, speaking of which, we have a facelift beer here. And I'm going to give you this one oh, for after you your can. interview. It's All cold. right, yeah. How about that? So used to warm beer. And that's from Cuyahoga Sequoia, <laughs> our proud sponsor of the facelift beer.
<laughs> All right. And um, what's the favorite thing? What was your favorite thing to do as growing up for the facelift? I mean, honestly, I think I was always pretty aware that that was the time to give back to Yosemite. Like that for me is the biggest piece of why the facelift is important. I always like, thought it was the raffle prize. You guys <laughs> I mean, would always too. pass them that out. That was always fun, like throwing cliff bars into the crowd and such. But I mean, picking up trash with, with Guy and Ruby, Ken's kids, and all the other park kids is always so much fun. How could picking up trash be so much fun? I don't know. It, it feels important. <laughs> um, I got another question for you. What have you been doing all summer? Uh, I've been serving tables at a little restaurant outside of the park and on my days off just getting into Yosemite and going climbing as much as I can and yeah now now I'm retired and I get to have the winter, <laughs> the winter to climb as much as I want. Very nice that sounds very familiar I had a similar lifestyle. <laughs> um, early retirement. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately I retired early now I gotta work. But, yeah. um, oh no, is that how it works? Yeah, oh, be God. careful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, also, uh, we're going to show another film in a minute, and I want to know how you got involved with that. It's a wild country film, and it's actually historical in nature. And uh, you went up on the Crimson Cringe, mm -hmm. and uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, last summer, I reconnected with a friend, Chris Van Leuven, who I hadn't seen in like years. And through him, met all these, you know, new climbers in the park, including Max Buscini. And they invited me out for, yeah, a day to mostly play Chris and, and help him on, on his project. But, um, yeah, it, it was great. Awesome. Um, I guess, uh, well, let's go ahead and see this uh, video. So Ray Jardine and John Lakey climbed Crimson Cringe back in 1976 to make its, its first ascent. And back then, it was done with Jardine's prototype called the Friend. The friends that were used that he first made set the foundation for the camps that are used today. Well, the first friends changed everything. I, I lived in Camp 4 at the time. There were rumors going around that he had this secret weapon. Ray Jardine was super secretive about his development of cams. He didn't want to tell anyone he was climbing with what he was doing because he didn't want to lose his idea to somebody else. And so he'd hide them under his jacket and people were like, who are you climbing with? Say, oh, I'm going climbing with my friends. And then he'd secretly like take off to the boulders and go tinker around. So it became the name of the first commercially available camming unit. Prior to that, we were using passive gear, um, you know, stoppers and hexes. And then these things came along, which the more parallel the craft, the better they held. And up to that point, there wasn't any gear on the market that protected parallel tracks. Suddenly, we didn't have to hang there in the middle of this parallel section, sticking around with a stopper and trying to go, oh God, it might hold. But cams, boom, plug it in, clip, go. And you know it's good, put another one in, clip, go. Oh, it's hard for you? Hang on it. So suddenly, everybody was climbing at a better level. Crimson Cringe is a perfect place for his invention because the friends fit beautifully in the crack. The terrain is difficult enough where he has to rely on them to hold falls. And by using them, he was able to push himself to his limit. You know, these routes wouldn't have been done without him. And also by doing these routes, which at the time were the top in difficulty in the United States, climbers around the world heard about them. And so suddenly they became test pieces. These cams were designed for Hangdog Flyer, Phoenix, and Crimson Cringe, which is why when you climb these routes, friends fit perfectly. 
So the first friends were rigid stem. Of course, all the friends have four opposing lobes, and they also had a short sling. What's changed is the modern zero cams since gone to a flexible stem. They have narrow cam heads. They fit pin scars. They fit flared cracks. And most importantly, they're secure and bomber. I actually met Chris before I can even remember having deep roots here in Yosemite himself. So it was fun to be reintroduced to Chris uh, earlier this summer. Like Chris isn't just a strong valley climber, but he's sort of a fixture within the Yosemite climbing community. And I mean, he's been here for years and he's you know, personally witnessed the evolution of trad climbing gear and how that's changed climbing in Yosemite. I've been coming to this route since I was probably 19 years old and I'm 43 now. I come back and do it later in life. It brings me back to a place that I really enjoyed back then. And so climbing with the modern friends now in Yosemite where they were invented and retracing the routes that Jardine did with the original prototypes, I can feel the history of the route and feel the evolution of the gear at the same time. Thanks, Max, for contributing that video to this year's facelift. Uh, it's nice to see so many local faces in that video, um, including Whitney Stowe, who you just met. Um, up next is Paul Wignall from Skydive Yosemite. Um, you might know him from the Yosemite community. You might know him from the Mariposa community. Um, but he's got a pretty interesting backstory that he's going to go over tonight. So, Paul, you Hi, have a slideshow? Hi, I'm Paul Wignall. I guess I'm here to talk about how I ended up opening a skydive place outside of Yosemite. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess I do have a slideshow. Do you want to see it? Sure. Okay. And do I push this button? Oh, that's me. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, well, I, I started climbing around 15 years old, and then my mom had the idea that maybe I could model, and I met an agent. My brother is a photographer and a musician. He's, yeah, he's great. And uh, he took some photos of me, I took them in, and the uh, agent really liked me, and then I got a job in Yosemite. So I moved up there to go climbing. There's a payphone in Boys Town. That's how the agent contacted me. And uh, back then, aid climbing was popular. So you can see here, uh, aid climbing along uh, one of the bridges, maybe in Yosemite, maybe not. And everyone's face is hidden. <laughs> so um, yeah, there's Chris, uh, who was just in Max's uh, video that you just saw. And that's when Chris was young and on El Cap. And that's Zach in the background. But uh, yeah, it was crazy. like. Back then, aid climbing was like huge. Free climbing was like cool, but like on the cover of Climbing Magazine, it was like tons of aid climbing all the time. Eric Cole like doing a hard aid route and stuff like that. So it's kind of an interesting time to be in Yosemite. And it's really cool to watch Yosemite change over the years. I can't really say it's bad or good. It's just uh, new and different all the time, and it's great. So uh, there's me on the first pitch of the free blast. And getting up to mammoth ledges. Uh, I was taking my friend who's not a climber up there. It was great. Um, so working up there in the 90s, 96 um, and 97. And then um, there's Chris Mack from Super Topos uh, when he's real young and on El Cap. 
but it was it was a neat time to be in Yosemite and there's a lot of cool things happening in Yosemite at the time and I continued to stay in touch with my agent from the payphone in Boys Town and uh, my modeling agent and uh, oh, my wife's in the middle there in the black and that's um, Jason Smith on the left singer uh, who's done a bunch of crazy adventures in Yosemite and around the world. But anyway, um, so yeah, I just kind of had this interesting thing going on with the payphone and the modeling uh, kind of in the background. And, and oh, there's a shot of, of me doing some hair work. It's really hot. Um, and then that's in the bugaboos climbing. And oh, yeah. So. There's some good stuff in here. There's me struggling on super tr crack, because uh, although you know I loved climbing, I was never too good at it. But I guess that's why I was kind of like into aid climbing. That was in um, let's see, uh, oh Times Square in New York, and it was really embarrassing to do that. And then you know I kept kind of doing like odd jobs and going to New York. Uh, I went to New York like once or twice. I met a photographer that really liked me, and then he booked me for Absolute Vodka, Tom Ford. And you could see like it's really extreme uh, lighting there. Um, and then I did Gucci. And this is right when um, the, um, the people that made Zoolander sent their team out to uh, Milan, and I was doing a lot of fashion shows in Milan. So their team was, came backstage and interviewed a lot of the models. And I used to carry like a case of like 24 yo-yos around with me because I um, yo-yoed a lot. Um, it was really boring backstage at fashion shows. So um, anyway, so yeah. Um, when I was being interviewed by the people that made Zoolander, or their team, um, I was doing a bunch of yo-yo tricks for them and backflips. And at that time, a lot of the Brazilian models used to carry around like uh, razors with them, and they would scoot around on razors. They would take the subway where they needed to go, and then razor where they needed like to get to their castings and stuff. So a lot of the little elements from um, uh, that movie Zoolander were put into the movie, uh, you know, from the fashion at that time. Um, the movie was based on two models from the late 80s and early 90s, um, but when they researched it, we were the people that they were researching, we were in the fashion industry. And at that time, uh, oh, you can see like the head bandana that was for the Gucci show in Milan, and that's backstage, and then you get, boom, like, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> And at the same time, you like Ben Stiller was on the cover of George magazine, and then he's got a yo-yo, and that's before the movie came out. And then, um, yeah, I have a yo-yo here. Maybe I'll do a trick or something at some point. But anyway, I, I was you know yo-yoing a lot. There's me yo-yoing backstage in Florence at a runway show. Me yo-yoing for an editorial. Oh, there's me and Carl Lagerfeld. Um, that's, I think they based Mugatu off of Lagerfeld because it kind of looks that way to me. But <laughs> um, so yeah, I did like a bunch of that for a while. Um, there was me and Heidi Klum rolling around. Um, yeah, so, you know, lots of modeling. And I was still rock climbing and hanging out with a lot of my climber friends. There's uh, me with a yo-yo again uh, and another yo-yo. Uh, me and Helmut Newton um, in Monaco just hanging out. That guy's rad. Uh, that was it for H&M in Sweden. That's at the Versace Mansion with Boy George. Uh, the drummer from Rolling Stones, what is this, Ronnie, Ronnie Wood or I don't know. Uh, that's me in front of me. And what was pretty cool, so because I was able to travel the world quite a bit and going around and doing all these cool modeling things, it was enabling me to go climbing with some of my friends that I grew up with in Yosemite. 
And this is a picture of me and Singer and Leo Holding and John Dickey and uh, Pep Massip, um, who all have a huge history in Yosemite and in the climbing community. Um, and that was in Spain. Uh, we did a lot of fun things in Spain and in France. And this is, I think this is, this picture was taken, uh, they had been captured in Kyrgyzstan and then um, that whole thing went down and um, Singer and John ended up meeting with some Hollywood people in LA and I went and met up with them and it was kind of funny. Um, <clears throat> the Hollywood people were, were working on Born Identity, the movie, and uh, they, were, they, they wanted to send those guys back to film some stuff in Kyrgyzstan and uh, they did. And then uh, somehow they like hitched a ride and ended up in uh, France. And I met up, met up with them in Chamonix right after that trip. So it was a, kind of a neat thing. Uh, there's Pep in the Gunks and my other model friend, Alex. And there's the Twin Towers with a bunch of models. And that's Aaron Martin sitting down with a blue shirt. He's a, a climber and a good friend from Yosemite. And then the Twin Towers went down. Um, my apartment was like right down the street from where that was at. And then I kind of stopped modeling, but then I have friends with companies and every once in a while I'll do a modeling job. Uh, and then and then kind of didn't know what to do with my life, right? So then I was like, kind of went climbing some more because I thought that was a good idea. And then, um, Let's say, oh, and then I tried, uh, me, me and my wife tried to open a, a clothing company and we, we did successfully for a little while, but then um, the housing market tanked and a bunch of the stores that we had relationships with closed down. And so my other friend owned a repo business and I thought maybe, hey, I should try like uh, getting into that. And that was a bad idea because two weeks later I almost lost my eye. And that's what this photo is from. Uh, and I've had like several surgeries since then and it all sucked. Um, and then I decided, you know, since I had a bad eye, maybe get into skydiving. And then I uh, did that maybe 13 years ago. And I knew about this airport up here at Mariposa Yosemite Airport. And I thought, hey, that would be a cool spot for a skydiving place. So eventually I got to the point where we, were able to make a um, skydiving place here. That's Jim, Jim Reynolds before he knew how to climb very well. That's kind of funny. That was uh, on White Punks on Dope in uh, The Needles. We lived in uh, San Luis Obispo and he was there in high school and I used to go climbing with him and uh, his buddy David. Um, but anyway, that's funny. Uh, that's on Half Dome. That's um, Cedar's All Terrain Pug and my dog Bandito. Uh, that's on Zodiac. That's in Baffin. And then later, I you know got invited to go climb in Baffin, and that was a fun trip with Singer and Lori Butts and some other folks. And uh, Asgard was fun, and then I ended up modeling again for uh, some uh, Mountain Standard company, and that was fun too. And then now here we are with the skydiving business in Yosemite, and it's great. Oh, yeah, that's the story of my life. Wow, very interesting, Paul. Um, I got a few questions. One is, you know, it seems like both these things really don't go together. For one, uh, a lot of the crack climbing I've done, I end up with little scrapes on my hands and stuff. How did you deal with that, going from climbing, say, El Cap, getting all gobied up, and then having to go and model on the runway? Well, I booked one um, hand modeling job, and the photographer was really mad. <laughs> And that's the, that was the end of my hand modeling career. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm not really a hand model. I was more like uh, my, my big uh, sharp nose was high fashion and cool for that. So they aimed the camera there. And um, I also understand uh, we're featuring 
your brother tonight in uh, some rock and roll. Yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. he plays yeah. for War Girl. Yeah, War Girl band. Yeah. And oh, okay. yeah. That's true. Yeah. How how long has he been playing music, and uh, what was it like growing up with a musician? Well, um, he's been playing music my whole life, and and um, I remember like in junior high, like. Uh, him with like 063 wig I think was the band and they like played like uh, like kind of punk or something like that like Primus style you know mm -hmm. uh, I don't know and there was a lot of people in the backyard and my parents got real mad <laughs> so yeah it's fun yeah <laughs> and uh what prompted you to be a repo man? It was you just needed the money, or I, I just needed a job, cool? and the guy said you can scout for cars and go find cars, and I went and found a car, and then um, and then it got real bad. Yeah, there's like helicopters and car chase. Stinger was actually in the car. Oh, now it's that one. Uh, oh, the cameras keep switching. <laughs> <laughs> we can look at the camera or me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, it was uh, yeah, it was a bad idea to try and do that business. <laughs> and, and how long have you been uh, up here with Yosemite Skydive? We've had our business open for uh, four years, our skydiving business. Yeah, and um, and it's going good. We're jumping a lot, and it's got its ups and downs. Ha ha ha. It's not my true calling in life, though. I've always wanted to be a outdoor chef. So we'll get into that in a little bit, maybe. Nice. Um, <laughs> you know what? I First of all, rock climbers, I mean, we're supposed to be kind of macho, most of us, but not all of us. But uh, how do you go from, like, macho rock climber, do you give lessons on how to walk on the runway? What did they tell you? Can you show us real quick? Uh, they just said walk, man. Like, you got Let's it. Let's see. Can you show us? Is there I a special way? I'm washed up, man. I'm like, I'm all chubby and like, come on. Okay, we won't go there. How about, uh, could we see some yo-yo tricks? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, trick. I'll do, I'll do like one or two. Yeah. I've got yo-yoed too much in my life. Um, uh, okay, oh, this is the hydrogen bomb. Oop. Okay, there's one. Whoa. Nice. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> you must have spent a lot of time in the back there. Yeah, you had uh, hotels and uh, backstage. Double-handed loop-de-loops are hard, though. Um, <laughs> that's an easy trick. Um, I think Laura's got some questions for you. Um, you got some questions for Paul, Laura? Yeah, um, mostly, yeah, you just have this crazy background with all these different things, but kind of like you were starting to touch on, um, you actually have had this dream to be an outdoor chef. Is that right? Yeah, that's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've started uh, a show, I believe. Yeah. Before we opened Skydive Yosemite. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, um, I think we're going to play that commercial teaser so people can see what that's all about. Oh, great. Okay. Oh, hello there. Welcome to Camp 4 Cooking. I'm Paul, and we're on a big cliff. God, it makes me hungry. Thanks, Camp Fork cooking. Peanut butter and jelly time. Action-packed cooking with special effects. Guacamole 
And I think Matt Wignall and War Girl are playing next. That's great. Oh, that's super. you feel about me now got my emotions running wild and now you're asking yourself how i'm not your baby ain't your child don't contradict me when i ask you to I'd like to thank the film crew tonight, uh, Jim Painter, Ed Whittle, Michelle Look, Karen Miller. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. They did all the live streaming tonight. And uh, I'd also like to thank all our presenters that put their programs together. And I'd like to thank all you facelifters out there. You're cleaning up the park everywhere as part of Act Local. We couldn't do it without you. And special thank you to all our sponsors. Thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll see you tomorrow for more programming. Good night.